Welcome to the Property Management Mastermind Show with your host, Brad Larson. Brad owns one of the fastest growing property management companies in San Antonio, Texas. This podcast is for property managers by property managers. You'll hear from industry leading professionals on best practices, new ideas, success stories, and lessons learned. This is your opportunity to learn about the latest industry buzz surrounding property management, as well as tips and strategies to improve your business. Now here's your host, Brad Larson. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here on the Property Management Mastermind podcast. Be sure to check out our website at propertymanagementmastermind.com, where you will find all of our episodes, products, and services to review to include our newly launched BizDev Mastermind offering, which is consulting services for companies looking to hire and grow using a business development manager. You can visit that site at bizdevmastermind.com. In addition, I wanted to announce the Property Management Mastermind Annual Conference going on in Las Vegas, March 234 at the Mirage Hotel in 2020. Visit the website at pmmcon.com. If you sign up for the conference and both add-on seminars, you'll get a 10% discount. I look forward to seeing you in Las Vegas. Lastly, be sure to find us on Facebook to join the conversation of over 6,000 members in the Property Management Mastermind Facebook group. Choose Seacoast Commerce Bank as your property management bank of choice. Seacoast Commerce Bank specializes in trust accounts and business banking for property managers. One of their best features is a cash analysis program where they can assist in paying your property management related invoices. Contact Allison at 619-988-6708 to learn more. And be sure to listen to the Property Management Mastermind Podcast, episode number 26, about Seacoast Commerce Bank. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Property Manager Mastermind Show. I'm your host, Brad Larson. And today's guest, I have Mr. Matthew Whitaker. And we're going to be talking about mergers and acquisitions. So Matthew is going to be presenting at the Property Manager Mastermind Conference as a marquee keynote speaker. But he's going to be also giving us a killer deliverable that he's going to be bringing to the conference. And we're going to be distributing prior to his presentation of his checklist and his outline for doing an acquisition. Because what I came to him about six months ago, nine months ago, I said, hey, Matt, I want you to do a presentation at the conference on what happens when an acquisition falls in your lap. Because I truly firmly believe that a lot of us out there as property management company owners or operators or even staff members look at this and say, all of a sudden, a two, three, 400 home portfolio company walks up to you at the buffet line and says, hey, man, I'm ready to retire. Can you buy me? And that's when it's like, whoa, it gets real. Now what? And so without further ado, I'm going to get back and give Matt some time to introduce himself. So Matthew, please give us some five W's on yourself. Yeah, thanks, uh, Brad. Thanks for having me on. Uh, super excited. I've listened to your podcast for a long time, and I'm uh, very excited about the opportunity to be on. Uh, and my first uh, trip on Facebook Live. So hey, everybody on Facebook. Uh, yeah, so I run a company called GK Houses. Uh, we are in eight different markets. Uh, our biggest market is in the Colorado, uh, kind of the front range of Colorado. So we're in Denver, Fort Collins, and Boulder. Uh, we're also here where I am sitting right now in our corporate offices in Birmingham, uh, Nashville, Chattanooga, uh, Little Rock. And then last month, we just opened in Atlanta. So we bought a company, uh, Atlantic Property Management. They were kind of tied into the Narco community. So a lot of people know them. Uh, we bought them closed on November 1st. So we've been running that business for uh, six or seven weeks. So a lot of this stuff's very fresh on my mind. Good stuff there. So give some background too. I'm very upset with you still for passing me at the PM Health 5K at the last NARPM National Conference. Uh, I thought, hey, I'm walking into this. I'm a good runner. I ran cross country in high school. No, Matt passed me up like I was standing still and beat me by a good minute. So I'm still pretty yeah, I, was, about that. I was wondering about that trailer you had hitched to the back of uh, you. So um, I was very fortunate that uh, you had that trailer on you. It was like a governor that I could just cruise right by. You. Boy, some of those hills, you wouldn't think there'd be hills in, in that area, but man, some of really, they were pr pretty brutal. So big thing I want to talk about with you on the acquisition side is the distinguishing factor of what you're doing is you are all private money. And so we hear a lot about venture capital. And there's a lot of good points to both. So I just want to be clear. I want to be clear on that, that you're doing private money. You've got some, you know, loans out that you've, you've done all this with. And 
uh, you've got some really good backers that you're working with on the private side. So tell us more about that and kind of how that background came into play to help you start acquiring other companies. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think people need to understand that there's a really kind of what I see, and uh, somebody can probably correct me on this, but there's really three types of money out there. There's venture capital, uh, private equity, and then there's kind of more like friends and family. So um, venture capital and private equity are looking for certain things. And, uh, but to get to a certain point where one of them is going to be interested in you, you've got to grow to a certain size has been my uh, experience. So uh, what I've been doing is using a lot of debt. So I've been using bank debt to buy businesses. I've also been using a lot of seller finance. So it's uh, the expectation for people that they're going to uh, be able to put money in a market, especially as high as the market is now. Uh, we give sellers an opportunity to earn a return uh, based on the equity in their business when we buy it. And then the other thing I've been using is what I call friends and family. So I've been raising capital, essentially selling shares in the business to friends and family um, to, uh, to, to buy these businesses. So they're getting some benefit. They know I'm out there uh, buying businesses, growing this kind of uh, business bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're participating in some of that upside. So uh, it's, it's really weird. It's kind of a weird place to be when you raise friends and family capital. So we're just coming through Thanksgiving. We're headed into the holiday season. A lot of the people that I'm going to Thanksgiving dinner with or Christmas dinner with are people that I've raised money from. Uh, but they're, they're, they're basically, you know, rich people in the, um, in the uh, market, it, rich, rich, rich friends and family, and everybody's got at least a small network of them. So, you know, you need to use all of your resources when you're out building these businesses, especially if you want to start aggregating and growing the business bigger. Using a big thing called, it's an acronym called ASK, ASK. You're asking There's no for, doubt. And if you just ask, you'd be surprised. And so yeah. a lot of us don't have the gumption or the spine, or we're just, you know, we don't want to work with friends and family, but if you ask them and they believe in you and you believe in them, a lot of times they will give you an opportunity. And so I love that where you just, you're not afraid to ask for the money. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit because um, when I came to you, I said, Hey Matt, let's, let's, let's talk about the property management mastermind conference. I want you to present there because you have done all of these acquisitions and I want you to present basically an outline or a playbook on how to do those. So tell me more about what you've come up with. Yeah, one of the things that I think people need to understand is like, why would I do something like this? So this is kind of the first time I've talked about it, but I actually think if, if for somebody like us who wants to aggregate uh, the aggregate a number of uh, companies under one umbrella, I actually think the market right now is too fractured. I think there's too many small companies. So for somebody like me, I have to go buy you know two and four hundred unit uh, companies uh, at a time. It's just as much work. Um, and, and it's all the same to me. I'd rather buy a 2000 or a 1500 unit business than a two or a 400 unit business. So I actually think, uh, I think our industry could benefit from some consolidation, uh, from that standpoint. So that's the reason I would, that's the why, uh, if somebody would say, well, why are you basically giving the playbook away? That would, as a skeptic, that would be my first question. He's, he's not going to give the playbook away because it doesn't benefit him, but it, it truly does benefit um, uh, me if uh, I help other people grow bigger businesses. So um, the, the point on the deliverable is what I'd like to do is basically walk people through almost like a checklist of the things that we found that you need to do during, uh, during a diligence process. Like once you find a potential acquisition all the way up till closing day. So we have like a checklist of everything you need to make sure you get done on closing day, what do you need to make sure you get done? The first 30 days post, what do you need to make sure you get done? And then the first 90 days post. So these are things that we've learned, mistakes that we've made. Literally, I, you know, to I couldn't put a number on how much money we spent to come up with this checklist because we've made a ton of mistakes and this will help people not make those same mistakes. So let's do some fun role playing. All right. So, hey, Matt, uh, I've got 200 units in uh, Colorado, right? Denver area. And I'm looking to retire and, and move to San Cabo or San Lucas or Cabo, whatever. Tell me what I need to do. I mean, how's this going to work, Matt? So I'm a guy wanting to sell my company to you. What, what are the next steps? How does this work? Tell me what's going on. 
Yeah. So the biggest question is everybody's like, well, what do you pay? You know? And, and so the, what, that's typically how the first call goes is I'll kind of walk them through how we look at value. So um, what I, what, what people need to understand if they're selling their businesses for somebody who's buying, it's all about risk and value, right? So what am I risking to buy your portfolio and what are you risking? So we, we have this kind of uh, this, this, yin and yang of risk that we have to decide. If you're willing to take on more risk, and sometimes people do that in clawbacks, if sometimes people do that in, um, in earnouts, but if you're willing to take on more risk, then you can actually make more money because what, I, what you're saying is I believe in this business, I believe that my clients are very sticky, and I believe that, you know, Matthew, you're not going to screw it up. And I'm going to make more money because those clients, and we're going to tie that risk to how many of those clients um, uh, terminate or, okay. or the attrition. Let's get some red meat here. So I'm selling my company okay. back to the role playing. So Matt, what do you typically pay out? Are you paying out? Let me finish here. You pay out on an X revenue of, of the revenue, like a multiple of a revenue. Do you look at EBITDA and pay out an X multiple on the EBITDA? Do you look at, you know, price per door, right? We've all heard that technique. How much per door yeah. is that, is that units going for? And I don't need necessarily hard numbers. Windows are cool if you have anything that you've seen, but just kind of what, is there an industry trend or something that is more prevalent than others as far as how to value a company? What are you seeing? Yeah, so I think what people need to understand is most of our businesses uh, or most of the businesses in this industry are really more like uh, self-employed, like they're running a job. Um, and, and that's, I'm not trying to like, uh, downplay what people are doing by saying that, but truly there is no EBITDA because if somebody had to replace them, and I think Jordan did this study and was showing the profitability of these companies. If you replace them with somebody making a salary, uh, if you replace the operator with somebody making a salary. So uh, to, honestly, for the seller at these size companies, it's not really in their best interest to sell based on an EBITDA because if somebody, if we applied a true EBITDA multiple to your business, then, then there wouldn't be much money. So you would be, you know, you hear five times EBITDA and maybe five times $20,000 or something very, very small. So what we say is, look, that's not necessarily fair to the seller. What we think is because we're going to, we're going to give the seller some benefits of our scale, but we're also going to get some benefits. So we're going to kind of meet in the middle there. And we think revenue is a better uh, indicator of profitability. So what we do is we look at uh, what that business is doing from a revenue standpoint. And then we basically wipe out all the seller's expenses. And we say, Hey, if we're going to run that business, what's it going to cost us? Now we have enough of a track record where we can pretty accurately predict, you know, based on the 200 homes, the revenue that 200 homes generates, and what, what we're going to, um, you know, what the, what our expense structure is going to be to run that. And then, so, so basically we're going to say, Hey, you know, you hear the number a lot, one times revenue. And, but that again, gets into how much risk, how much, how much somebody else is willing to take on. But, but that's what, that's kind of how we look at it is we look at it, not from the standpoint of EBITDA, but we, we basically back into our own EBITDA number using our own expenses and the seller's revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. makes a lot of sense there. And so that's what the next question would be is, okay, is there a range? You kind of, you kind of mentioned one X of revenue, but that's not a hard and fast figure necessarily. It might be worse. It might be better. It might be terms. Um, you know, it, it could be finance or owner finance. It could be cash up front. It could be over two or three or 10 years. And so the X on the big figure, the sales price will deviate depending on the terms. So talking about that. Yeah. So if somebody said, if somebody just walked to me, put a gun to my head and said, Hey, what is a management company worth? I, I would probably give them that one times revenue number. But, but just like you said, I mean, those terms can change uh, a bunch. I mean, if it's a small, super small business that doesn't have uh, a lot of homes, sometimes those trade at, you know, way less than that one times revenue. Uh, as a property management company gets bigger, it may trade, when it does have a true EBITDA, it may actually trade it more than that one times revenue based on what that true EBITDA number is. But I think if, again, if somebody came up to me one times revenue, then you mentioned something I think is very important is, again, terms. Uh, are you willing to sell or finance? Are you willing to take on some of the risks? So 
there are all these, uh, I used to have a partner that would say, you, uh, you tell me what you, you know, what the, as a seller, what you want me to pay and I'll give you the terms. And, and the point is, uh, as long as the terms are right, sometimes you can come up with a sales price that everybody can be happy with. But those are all moving things based on different people's expectations, different people's situations. Um, I get back to the point of seller finance. I think that it's in a lot of sellers' best interest to seller finance because we all believe, or well, I, I personally believe, and maybe that seller believes that the stock market may be, um, you know, at or near, and maybe we're going to head into some sort of, uh, you know, minor recession. And what about earning a consistent? Um, you know, return on the equity that I've built in this business. If you trust the buyer and you trust them to be able to cover that payment, then uh, it's a great way to earn, you know, a really healthy interest rate on, on your money. Interesting tidbit on the side there. So we've all heard about the Australian market. I talk about it a lot on this show because it's a good comparison to look at that particular market as a, as a property management market in Australia, New Zealand. So there's companies there on every day will go for 5x revenue. Yeah, so I've heard that. Bob, Bob Walters, who is going to be at the Property Management Mastermind Conference, who started LPMA, Leading Property Managers of Australia, he's a guy modeling the conference after what they did for the last 15, 20 years in Australia and New Zealand. They're talking about, in Sydney, getting 5x revenue for a management company. And so it's a completely different market because it's flipped. They're going to get 70 to 80% penetration. We're getting 20 to 30% penetration in the market. So it's a flipped deal, but they also can't charge the fees that we can. So when they get three, four, five X revenue, it's pretty much just on their straight little management fees. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting deal how the how the multiples change. But I would argue, I would argue that the dollar figure, dollar for dollar, is probably very similar. Maybe they're twenty percent higher, twenty five percent higher, but not five times higher. Interesting. So, because they don't charge the tenant fees. Yeah, right? they can't. They just, you know, the state and the, the states of Australia and of course the country, they just have a, a real big policy of, of keeping tenants. It's almost like you're trying to, you know, it's like a California or New, or New York on a large scale. They're just, they can't charge the tenant fee. So it's just a completely interesting tangent I want to go on just because I like talking about those things to hear when Bob Walters talks about management companies going for Sydney and 5X revenue and you hear that and you're like, whoa, I'm moving to Sydney. That's, a, that's, that's pretty amazing. But yeah. all right, so back to the acquisition side and your portion, um, I wanted to talk about, you know, you're walking through, okay, I'm a 200 company owner, I'm in Denver, and I'm, you're walking me through this. So we have our initial conversation, you kind of answered the questions about the, the, the acquisition side as far as at least the multiples or the value. So what would be the first steps? And what are you looking to do first thing if we can say, okay, we're kind of agreeing on a somewhat price and terms just verbally, what do you do from there? Yeah, this is really a lot like dating. Uh, there's kind of like the first date and it's almost like speed dating. Hey, do, can we kind of wrap our brains around potentially going on a second date? For us, the second date is one of two things. It is either uh, me coming, if, if you're interested in selling to us, it is me coming to the market and spending a day with you. And basically, I like to wrap my brain around you know, what is this company? And, you know, maybe I've heard of you, but just develop a relationship with a seller. It's, it's super important for the buyer and seller to develop a good relationship because uh, once you actually like work out a deal, like both, both parties are very excited about it, but it, that's the, that, and I, I told, we bought uh, Betty Fletcher's business in Little Rock. I said, you like me now more than you will ever like me in the history of our relation or in the future of our relationship. Because, uh, because then you get into, uh, you know, I'm asking for information. You, you start to see each other's warts. So very much like dating. At first you think, hey, this person's perfect. And then the more you date, th then the, the warts start to appear. So what I, getting back to your question though, I'll either go to that market and spend some time with them, uh, try to understand, um, you know, the operations of the business. One of the great things is somebody that's been in the business. I mean, I, I, I started this property. I was, I was literally answering tenant calls and answering owner calls. I still get phone calls to my uh, cell phone from, uh, from old owners that I've onboarded on the business. So I can really go in and understand that business uh, pretty quickly. Uh, or the, the, the other piece that can happen almost simultaneously is I like to get a little bit of information from them. Uh, it's not like super probing. It's stuff that they can probably pull in less than an hour. 
but it just gives me an idea about the financial health of the business, uh, kind of fees that they're generating, uh, where they're generating fees from, trying to understand what they're doing right now. Like what's the service level? Are they running a really skinny operation? High margin, really skinny? Are they, you know, very customer service focused? They've had the same clients for forever. And there's, there's, it's a double edged sword. I mean, there's some good and some bad about both, but really I'm just trying to wrap my brain around what, what is this business? And I can do that. I have to do that two ways. One is by seeing it, touching it. And the other one is by understanding the numbers. So those, those two happen kind of simultaneously. I know in previous conversations, you talked about um, asking the seller, what do they want? And that, that's not just necessarily monetarily wise. That's talking about what do you want this to look like in the end state? Like, what do you want? Do you want to go live on a beach somewhere? Do you want to retire to the mountains? I mean, do you want to, I don't know. I mean, tell me what you want. And then you kind of work around that. This is a big deal. I mean, when some, I always tell, tell somebody too, I mean, what you need to know what you want and you need to know, um, you know, you need to make sure that you're ready to do this because people are selling their livelihood and that's a big, big, big deal. And sometimes they're selling their legacy. And so they need to make sure that this is something that they're prepared to do because, uh, you know, you hear all these horrible stories about entrepreneurs that sell their business and then they have no, they, they have no like reason uh, for being because the business has always been their reason for being. So I think it's, it's pretty important to kind of dig into the psychology of this too, because also a seller having something to do or some sort of passion to pursue uh, post closing is very important to me because if they if they're still uh, if their identity is continuously tied up in the business they're gonna they're gonna be kind of a uh, they're gonna always be a little bit of a pain on the back end every time an owner gets frustrated with some new process that we're running they're gonna reach out to the old owner and if the old owner is still their identity is still tied to the business then that's a that's gonna be a, a big challenge. So you're getting part psychologist there a little bit. You're looking at kind of what they want and how you can potentially make that happen for them. Well, you know, I went to Alabama, so it's basically like the Stanford of the East or the Harvard of the South. So, uh, we, you know, multiple, um, you know, multiple degrees. The business school just uh, produces a well-rounded uh, business person, I guess. They're so humble. I mean, they're <laughs> amazingly humble. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I was, you couldn't see it if you're listening on the podcast. I fell over in my chair laughing and then had to get back up. So now we're, all right, right, let's back to reality here. Came okay, at back to reality. What are some of the paperwork things involved? Okay, you, you met, you did their, you know, a little bit of due diligence. You're talking a couple hours, an hour, maybe some real long conversations, maybe in-person meeting. What's the first step in the paperwork? You put these ideas on a napkin. What do you do? Yeah, so the first thing really is getting a non-disclosure agreement signed. So uh, one of the things we want to, we want a seller to know is that we're not going to go share your information with a bunch of people. We're just going to use this for our internal um, kind of knowledge to make a decision about whether to you know have a second or a third date. And then if we decide that that's not going to work, we're just going to destroy your information and move on. Um, that's so not there's something people should be scared of. No, sorry to interrupt you, but. You know, yeah. people here non-disclosure. Oh my God, that means we're locked in. No, it just means, you know, let's not talk about publicly what we're discussing. It's not binding. It's not, you know, something that's going to be uh, overly intrusive. So, uh, you know, it sounds like an awful thing to have to sign just to even have a conversation, but it's really not. No, I think it protects the seller's best interest. I think as a seller, you should definitely want that before sharing any information. It gives you, even, even our non-disclosure gives the seller all, tor all sorts of uh, protections against me going out and, you know, standing on the street corner and telling everybody about their business. So it, it, it really is a, uh, out of respect for the seller, something that we do because we want the seller to know that we're not going to, we're going to protect that information and we're going to only use it to make our decisions. So that's the NDA is the first thing that we get signed. Okay, so we get that signed and then what? How does it work? Yeah, so, so then, of course, we talk about that second date, whether I come there or we, we start to do diligence. And then what we try to do is we come up with what's called a letter of intent, which uh, some people call it an LOI. And the whole idea is that before we start to do some really intense diligence, some really intense things, you and I are going to agree in principle on what this deal looks like. So this is where you're going to get a little more granular in terms of uh, deal structure. You know, how are, how, how is this money going to be paid? Is it seller finance? Is it, um, is it uh, all cash? 
You're also going to get more granular on the actual price. So you can have a reasonable expectation that when we get to closing, this is the deal. Um, basically what it's saying is based on our diligence, which is kind of uh, very surface level, this is what we're willing to do. And we kind of agree in principle under this LOI. And it's only, ours is only a three or four page document, very simple to understand. And it basically outlines the terms of, hey, we kind of agree in principle to this deal. And this is what's going to happen to get us to closing. So it's going to say things like, you know, this is non-binding, uh, you know, except where it talks about it's binding. So it's not, a, it's not a contract. It's basically like us saying, you know, it's us agreeing to date even longer. Uh, it's going to outline how the diligence process is going to take place. Some things for us as the buyer that we're going to have some expectations around data that you're going to be uh, willing to deliver to us. Um, it's going to set out a close day. Uh, it's just going to outline some general terms of the agree of what the agreement's actually going to look like. Secrecy is key there. Would you not agree? Secrecy. Yeah, I mean, the staffers and people that don't need to know necessarily. I mean, that's, that's always kept in between everybody else, correct? Well, that is very important. I, I think as a seller, you know, you don't need to tell your staff. And, and as the buyer, I don't tell my staff until they're on, they're, everybody's on a need to know basis. So we run a very transparent company. I even share my whole P&L with everybody in my organization. But this is, I am protecting the seller too. So it's very important that I only bring into this process and the seller only brings into the process people that are going to help them or help me make decisions. So, uh, so as I will, I will stand up in front of our organization and say, I, you know, we are working on deals. I cannot tell you because I'm, I, I, I promised these people I wouldn't tell them, uh, tell you that I was doing this because our industry is a very tight knit industry. There's a lot of, uh, everybody kind of knows everybody in this kind of small niche world. And it's super important that as we go out and, um, you know, go to these conferences that we protect your information. And that part of that LOI says that, Hey, we're only going to tell these people that we've agreed kind of in principle to these items. Let's pick on your Alabama education just for a minute. It's niche, not niche, whatever that effing word is that you just said. And I think if you, I think scary. if you Google it, you can probably use both ways, but uh -uh. Nope. maybe that's why you say in Texas. Nope. 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 In Texas, we say whatever I just said. And of course, it's L O I, not L O I. Ah. Alabama. Ah. We got to work on you a little bit, Matthew. We're gonna we're gonna polish you up a little bit, man. Get you, you out of can, that Alabama. You can take the boy out of Alabama, but you can't take the Alabama out of the boy. Good stuff. I'm just picking on you because you and I have a good relationship. We've known each other for a little while. We have a lot in common, and so it's it's you can take the ribbing with the best of them, and and we have a lot of fun together. So this is a good conversation that we're having, talking about the acquisition. So we're getting to this point where we have an L O I signed. Right. And now we're starting the whole due diligence portion and you're doing more homework and reviewing of the business. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, in most, and in most cases, this is where the heavy lifting comes. It's the heavy lifting on our end. We're reviewing certain things like everything from your management agreement to your, uh, your rental agreement to uh, basically trying to tie your management agreement back to fees that are occurring in your management software uh, you're either going to have to pull reports out of your management software or allow us maybe view only access to your management software. This is, this is where the, everybody talks about the real pain, the, the, the real probing happens. Uh, what I will tell people though is uh, if you kind of expect it to be really bad, it's probably not going to be as bad as you think it is uh, just because an, a, an acquirer like us, like we're in the business. We kind of know what to look for we're acquiring very similar businesses. It's not like we're out uh, learning uh, the single family property management business or, or small multifamily property management business. We know that like we're operators. We, we can kind of see what's going on pretty quickly, maybe a lot faster than uh, you would if you went to just kind of somebody that was looking to invest just from a financial standpoint. So uh, it, 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 this, this diligence process, uh, it definitely takes some hours of your time. Um, and it's on top of the work that you're already doing, but it, it is the most labor intensive part, probably of the sellers. Uh, we'll get into the most labor intensive part of the buyers, 
uh, post acquisition, but this is probably the most labor intensive part on the sellers. And this is also where you're asked a lot of questions that may feel a little awkward. Um, you know, we're, we look at certain things and we'll ask you questions that may seem obvious, like what's an administration fee to you? Uh, those types of questions, because we're really trying to understand, well, what are you really charging for? I mean, you call it an admin fee and we call it a, you know, a leasing fee. Um, it, you know, there's also a parlance difference. And so we're just trying to understand, we will literally go line by line, maybe through all your revenue items and ask you specifically, what does this mean? Yeah, this is where the NARPM accounting standard can come in very handy. So if somebody no were to be on the NARPM accounting standards, uh, they're going to be able to take a quick look at somebody with due diligence in a matter of minutes versus weeks. So this is another reason you want to consider getting onto the NARPM accounting standard. Just visit NARPM.org and look it up. You can find it. If you're a uh, property management company that wants to look that way, either in buying other companies, you want to be able to understand that, but you also want to be on that as your own property management company just for this either option, either you buy or you sell it benefits you extremely huge, the huge benefits to be on the NARPM accounting standards. So I think that's very important. <clears throat> um, boy, there's all kinds of things you said I wanted to circle back on. I'm, I'm just starting to remember, you know, misremember and forget what I want to talk about. You know how it gets when you get old, you know, I turn in all these different ages and losing all my influence on this. Okay, so one of the things we want to talk about is getting through that initial phase of the LOI and getting through some of the due diligence what happens from there? Yeah, so uh, during the diligence, you're also kind of hammering out a contract. So this is the point where it truly, because one of the things that's different between this and maybe uh, maybe selling a house, like if you go go to closing a house, there's all these, uh, a lot of documents to sign. You'd be surprised at how few documents you have to sign to sell your whole livelihood, your whole business away. So the contract is really the meat of this thing. So, um, so while we're doing diligence, we'll also simultaneously be working on a contract, which lays out specifically the terms. I mean, it lays out things like, what are you going to do as the seller? Like, what is the, what are we requiring of you post closing? Uh, what are the expectations of you post closing? What are we going to do with the trust funds? How are we going to get the trust money from your trust account into our trust account? Um, you know, who, who, what are the operations going to look like in the first 30 days? So this answers all the boxes that, um, that, that you would need to know to make sure that there's consistency of operations because we're not selling a house that, Hey, if nobody went to the house for three or four days, the house is still going to be fine. Like literally you are going to, um, you are going to have to, uh, uh, drop, you know, there, there can't be a drop ball even over a weekend. Like it needs to be a smooth landing from, you know, from point A, which is the seller owning it to point B, which is us owning it. So you hammer out some of the contract stuff, right? That's all that's in writing. It's pretty standard stuff. A lot of us in real estate, we get it. Let's talk about the dirty word. The dirty word is clawbacks. Yeah. So talk to me about some of that. How does that work? What are the expectations? Uh, what are the pitfalls? I mean, just kind of give me what you know there. Yeah, no, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't really think it's a dirty word. I think part of the thing is you need to know who the, who the buyer is. And so a lot of it depends on your, your ability to trust how well the buyer is going to operate that business. I think, I think to some degree, um, you know, if, if, if somebody's a good operator, there shouldn't be a drop off in operations. And, uh, and, and what we have found from the, uh, from the client's perspective that we're buying, they don't necessarily care how the sausage gets made as long as you're doing uh, certain things very well. So uh, Andy Props, I always credit him with saying this, and he is absolutely right. As long as you get the accounting correct, so it's very important to get the accounting right and the communication right to the, to the clients and the tenants, it's really very smooth. So when, circling back around to your question, really the clawback is – you know, from a, from a buyer standpoint, we want to know that you hadn't like slapped on and made all these goofy promises to all of your clients. And then as soon as we come in and really try to run a real business and put some uh, systems and processes behind it, you've made all these random, um, you know, uh, promises to people. And now it's going to, um, now, now we're not going to be able to live up to those. And we're going to lose all those clients. That's the thing we, we don't want to happen. 
And so if you're a seller and you're thinking through a clawback, I mean, if you have a, a business where you have people that, uh, that are clients that have been consistent for a long time, then you, know, you probably wouldn't be afraid of a clawback, especially if you have confidence in the buyer. So let's kind of fast forward. So we get through the contract phase, we get signed up, we sign the big long 50 page contract or whatever, we go to closing, which is kind of like closing on a home. Or what do you, what are your, is it? No, it's, home? it is not like closing on a home. I mean, in, in my mind, like before I started doing this, I saw us showing up, the attorneys there, the buyer and the seller. It, it is, it is nothing like that. It, it is really remarkable how quickly you can sell your business. Um, at this point, um, there, there are a list of documents that you have to get signed, uh, but you can sit at your desk uh, in your office and I can sit at my desk in Birmingham and we can both uh, sign that we're, uh, you know, that you're selling and I'm accepting responsibility. Uh, the money gets wired. A closing is really a, uh, uh, it, it's just not as exciting as I think everybody builds it up that it's going to be this kind of very fun and exciting thing. And unfortunately, it's just not, doesn't have the, the it doesn't have the, the, the taste or the flavor that I think people no, expect. No champagne popping, no, There's, no dancing. Yeah, n- <laughs> and I'm not one to celebrate anyways, because uh, when I buy a business, like closings, like I just sign myself up for a whole bunch more work. So it is hard to get excited about buying a business because now you just, you just, you just like committed yourself to you know, 200 new, new clients and, and delivering on a service to those 200 new clients. And the, you know, the first six, they're really the first 30 up to the first 90 days is really very hard um, moving that business onto your processes. So getting back to closing, uh, closing can be kind of a bittersweet thing because you're so glad that you've gotten to this point uh, because you go on this roller coaster of emotions typically from, the time you start dating somebody, now you finally got married and you go through all these roller coaster emotions. But now, uh, now for the buyer, at least the work is just beginning. Explain what you're actually purchasing. So, this, yeah, like so there's two different types of, yeah. So we purchase typically assets uh, versus stock. So there's an asset purchase or a stock purchase. A stock purchase is basically you're buying stock in the operating companies. So, um, it, it, it's what you do when you buy stock uh, on the stock market. You're essentially buying, uh, you're becoming a part of that operating company. What we do is we basically buy uh, the assets out of the company, uh, meaning we just buy uh, goodwill, we buy the management agreements, we buy the things that the company owns. So I, I, I explain it like this to people. Um, let's say I owned a house in an LLC. Um, if I wanted to sell that house to you, Brad, I could sell you the LLC, honestly, you know, one, two, three main street LLC that owns this house. So I sell you the LLC. Now you own the house, or I can sell you the house from the LLC. And that's what we do is we essentially buy the house from the LLC and then you still own the LLC and we own the house. You're buying the cars and the lot, not the dealership. Correct. Yeah, good way to look yeah, at good it. Good way to put it. Yeah. yeah, that's what I kind of understood from those things as well. All right, so moving on, champagne's going off. We've closed. You know, initial funds have been wired. This is what you said earlier in pre show is now the work begins. Kind of walk me through some of that and what really has to happen. Yeah, so the first 30 days is very important. Remember, uh, accounting and communication. So you should have done a whole lot of diligence bringing up to. Uh, up to close day. And what we do in conjunction with that is move all of the accounting on our platform. What we found, this is, this is a key uh, that I think people can save a lot of time. What we, what we originally thought is, hey, we'll run their accounting system and then we'll convert later. But what we realized is some of the same things, like 80% of the same things that we were doing uh, in the diligence process basically also allows us to convert on day one. So this is kind of an insider tip. Once you, what we suggest is you're doing the diligence, do the extra 20% to move all of that uh, information into your property management software. And then day one, you're going to be running your, that business out of your property management software. Don't think that you can wait or, well, you certainly can, but you're doing, in our opinion, way more work because you've already done the diligence to get you to that point. 
reconciled trust accounts, reconciled owner statements, reconciled everything, do the extra work just to convert it day one. So getting the accounting right. And then the other thing is the messaging to the owners and the tenants. So very important, like you need to tell somebody day one where to pay rent, where to put in a work order, because work orders and rent don't stop. Typically we close at the end of a month. So rents almost immediately do. So while we may be popping champagne, we're also telling people where to deposit the money. Uh, and then the, one of the thing that I think we've probably stubbed our toe the most is just the messaging to the owners. It's very important that there's a consistent message that goes to the owners of what has happened. And you, know, you want to make sure, especially if you're keeping any legacy employees, that they understand the message, that they have a lot of clarity on what the plan is. Um, if you have your team running it, they, they should know the message to the owners and they should be clear on it. What you don't want is owners getting mixed messages. And we found that sometimes the legacy team gets a mixed message. So what we need, we know what we need to do is over communicate to the legacy team so that they know how to message to the owners. One thing we should probably talk about too on a bigger level is what's happening in the market as a whole. So I'm thinking, and maybe you can tell me this or, or not, more and more management companies don't have to advertise to sell. If you're selling a gas station, you probably got to advertise. If, you, if you're selling you know, a hair salon, you probably have to advertise. But more along the lines, the management companies, uh, it's becoming such a want or a hot commodity that they can put out a couple feelers and next thing you know, they're getting offers in writing uh, you know, very quickly. And just from in, inside of uh, the industry itself without ever having to really go in the open market, and I think that's going to that's gonna be a good benefit because it keeps multiples at a high level. Uh, it keeps from management companies selling to somebody that they don't know who anything they're doing of and, and causing bad blood. Because imagine if they sell to a company who's normally working in oil and gas and all of a sudden they want a management company because it looks fun and they come in and completely screw it up. And that just makes the whole market look bad, makes property managers look bad. So we're seeing more of, as we say, it's staying in house. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think it also benefits the seller too because there's synergies. And I've talked about it earlier. I mean, if we were taking a true EBITDA, then 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 the then, and that's what that oil and gas company would look for is hey, what 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 is the what is the contribution margin back to us? If we were taking that number, then then your business isn't going to be as worth as much. But you're getting to sell to you know an aggregator that's in the business that understands the business you're getting to benefit from some of their scale because they know that they're going to benefit from adding your management contracts or adding your business into and tucking it into what they're doing. There's, there's enough benefits that we can divide it. So I definitely think the aggregation is good for the industry. I think it also, um, it also uh, change the way the industry looks. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Uh, and, and one of the things I think is important, and I, I know this is kind of going off a little bit, uh, but I think it's important for people to know there still is a place for that, what I call boutique manager, which is the two to 400. I don't think people should feel like they have to grow to continue to compete. Um, as you scale, as you grow, uh, the business becomes way more complicated. And, uh, and, and so you're not necessarily just worried about property management anymore. You're worried about employees and PTO and just some crazy, crazy things that happens as this thing scales. So I also don't want, especially somebody listening to this thinks, well, I got to grow or die. That is not necessarily the case. You can stay. There's some great businesses that are around 300 units. They make great money. They live a lifestyle business. That is not our plan. That's not what we want to do. But I think it's important to know that you don't have to do something like this to compete. I also think that certain markets will only support a certain number of homes or a certain number of units to that particular management company. Yeah. Because, you know, you would think, oh, I'm in a giant market. I can grow to 10 billion homes under management. Well, at a certain point, you start to plateau and it's very difficult to get past that because of whatever reasons. The market, everybody knows you, your reputation, your Google rankings, your SEO. Uh, there's only so much time in a day to develop new business. You have churn that's naturally happening from sales. I mean, at a certain point, you know, it's just very difficult to g grow by leaps and bounds. I mean, put it in a quantifiable sense. Could you grow 10% every year for infinity? Probably not. Yeah. I don't think you could. I mean, it gets to, I mean, think of what 10% of 2000 is. Can you grow net 200 homes this year? 
net 200 homes. I mean, what do you have to do to do that? You got to add 500 homes necessarily. Right. So it's yeah, it would difficult. be interesting. That's, that's an interesting thought. I, you know, I don't know that any one management company has gotten to that lid yet, but I suspect there is a lid somewhere. Uh, but I just don't know. I don't, and, and you know more management companies than I do, but the density, uh, density in a, in a market equals profitability in our world. And I don't know what the lid is though. Where does it start to, where do you start to spin your wheels? And nobody knows that. Yeah. yeah nobody, nobody, it's it's, it's our, just an interesting thought. Our market is so fractured that nobody has hit that lid. And I suspect there's some people out there that are going to do it. Uh, I just, it'll be interesting to see what that, what that lid is when they get there. So let's, let's close this loop and talk to me about the deliverable that you're going to be throwing at us during the property management mastermind conference. So this is going to be on a PDF and we'll be able to provide it. Are you doing hard copies? What are we doing here? Yeah. So we're going to provide basically our hundred, a hundred uh, things you should do when buying a company. So it's going to walk you through uh, pre buying a company. It's going to have a checklist of things you need to make sure that you cover. Again, things that we, mistakes that we made in the past. This list, when we first bought our, uh, when we bought our first company, was probably 50 or 60 items long. So now it's more like 100. Uh, it's gonna walk you through uh, basically the, the 90 day buildup to closing, uh, what you do on the day of closing, what you do the first 30 days post-closing, and then walk you through uh, what to do uh, up to 90 days past closing. This literally is a checklist that I copy over every time we buy a business. So I'm, you know, going to deliver that and uh, let people use it and hopefully save some money on some dumb things that we've done in the past. You mentioned you spent quite a bit to get to this point. So, I mean, people are, are tapping into that knowledge just by attending the conference and getting your deliverables. So that's, that's pretty dang awesome. So let's close this loop real quick. And so if somebody want to get in touch with you, you know, give us your point of contact information. Yeah, I'd love to talk to anybody that has any questions. Uh, I have every now and then I'll have people call me and they'll be working through a deal and kind of get stuck, get stuck on something. Uh, so my uh, email is M as in Matthew Whitaker, W-H-I-T-A-K-E-R at G-K houses. That's G as in golden, K as in key houses, more than one, dot com. Or they can text me at uh, my cell phone, 205. 585-0415. Awesome. Appreciate you coming on the show. Look forward to having you at the Property Manager Mastermind Conference in March. Visit pmmcon.com to learn more and look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks again for coming on, Matt. We'll talk soon. Thank you for having me. Property Meld is made for maintenance work automation. Property Meld will work to schedule, remind, verify completion, and follow up with your residents automatically while providing the best-in-class communication system for your ease of use, your vendors, and your tenants. Begin reducing maintenance coordination time and increasing tenant satisfaction today. Learn more at PropertyMeld.com. This has been a podcast episode by PropertyManagementProductions.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us feedback, and come back for our next episode. 